This TEDx Boston talk is structured. <laughs> Thank you. In three acts. And like any great Shakespearean play, they all come together powerfully at the end. I want to start off with a central question for you to consider, which is this. Were you to suffer from depression, how would you understand the nature of your suffering? And what would you want to do about it? And could you even consider the use of a credible substance once banned from medical research? What would you want your overall treatment experience to be? I dedicate this talk to all of us who may develop a depression in our lifetime, and to anyone, friend or family, that we know who needs relief from suffering now. So the Buddha reportedly only taught of two things, of suffering and of the relief of suffering. And as a psychiatrist in practice for over 20 years, I've seen too much of that suffering from depression. Psychologically, as I understand it, the lion's share of that suffering comes from what I call false truths, fundamental misconceptions about what to expect from ourselves and from the world. So how does this happen, you might wonder? Well, imagine a baby able to cry, hopefully able to laugh, who, like a little scientist, observes the world trying to make sense of everything and learns what to expect from others, from themselves, and from the world at large. Well, that little baby was you, and you, and you, and me. Fast forward to the present, I think we can all see how we're all carrying around outdated notions about what to expect in life, overgeneralizations from specific circumstances of our childhood. And if we don't recognize them and re-edit what's providing us this kind of inner guidance, we're likely to be led erroneously. Fortunately, in brief therapy, false truths can be brought out into the light, illuminated. They're narratives. They can be re-edited and reinstalled to provide more accurate guidance so that we can experience the greater sunshine of our present and future potential. But unfortunately, all too often, a clinical depression sets in. It's commonplace, the number one cause of disability worldwide. Odds are, one in four of us, as a lot of people, will suffer from depression in our lifetime. If you were to become depressed now, what would you do about it? Well, for the second act, imagine that baby grown up, now finding through the stress of life that they feel incredibly off, that all their normal coping mechanisms don't seem to apply, that something's really wrong. If that little baby was you, you would what? Well, you'd hopefully recognize that something's wrong in the first place, because a lot of people don't. There's so much stress in life that even realizing that there may be a problem worth talking to a professional about is a step that many don't manage to take. But if you did, you'd go to who? Your primary care doctor, probably, assuming you have one and can get in quickly, and assuming you have enough time in the appointment to convey your experience, hopefully you'd get a diagnosis of depression, hopefully you'd get a recommendation for some psychotherapy, and certainly you'd get a prescription, probably an SSRI. But these days, in the COVID, post-COVID world, maybe you'd just turn to an app, fill out a questionnaire, double-click Apple Pay, and get the same script in the mail. Either way, though, you'd be unaccompanied on your effort at recovery. You'd be alone, home, hoping not to get some unacceptable side effect that would make you not want to take your antidepressant, and then hoping that over weeks you'd eventually get some amelioration of the suffering that you had from the beginning of this journey. 
And if you go through all those steps that I'm just describing to you, odds are only about 35% of all comers will get into full remission of symptoms. Clearly, that's not enough. The good news, and really the point of today's talk, is that we are now at an inflection point, a true revolution in available biotherapeutics for depression and in the patient experience. So for the third act, imagine that you, recognizing that you're depressed, go expeditiously to a convenient nearby treatment setting, a warm, welcoming place where you're greeted kindly and accompanied on your healing journey. You're given diagnostics and a choice of biological agents which work that day with the promise of relieving your depressed condition. Lying in a comfortable chair together with a nourishing guide, you're given an intravenous medication for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes or a pill, and you're encouraged to be present, be open to healing and to let go. And you leave feeling surprisingly better, possibly even cured, and if not, incredibly confident that you will be over the next few sessions. In this way, the odds of getting into full remission of symptoms for all comers to this kind of setting is as much as 85%, which is far superior. Now, these revolutionary biologic agents are here. One is available today, and two others should be available, fast-tracking through the FDA in the next year or two at the most. And I'm talking about ketamine, and I'm talking about psilocybin, and I'm talking about MDMA, true antidepressants that modulate different neurotransmitter systems, each with their own signature, but all promising more than just alleviation of symptoms, promising a new consciousness. So these new agents actually aren't new at all, really. Previously known by their street names of Special K, Magic Mushrooms, Ecstasy, they're all in the public domain, and they've been recently reimagined, proven safe and efficacious. They're acceptable, non-abusable substances, and when used in low doses in a healing environment, they can allow us to cast off our false truths and to connect more deeply to our own good grace and grateful connection to others and enjoy a positivity about the world. They're psychoactive rather than psychedelic when used this way. Research into best practices has reached mainstream psychiatry. We're looking at AI-assisted data analytics about dose titration, adjustments in the treatment setting, and in the overall patient experience. So honestly, for the first time in decades, the future of psychiatry looks incredibly bright to me, where instead of a patient care delivery process where the patient is really on their own, we are now curating an experience of healing which is accompanied and which offers the promise of this new consciousness. Let's all stay tuned. Thank you so much.